by direct the cybersecurity uh, uh, research center at MIT Sloan. It's a, a center that looks mostly at managerial, organizational, and strategic aspects, aspects of cybersecurity, but we collaborate across campus and have a lot of relations with CSAIL and others in, in our work. The first thing I want to get across is, is in the old world, we would design a power generation plant with eight turbines, and we would calculate the likelihood that one would go down. Right, and we would know approximately due to either you know failure of parts or whatever it is that one could go down with some probability, and that the probability of the next one going down would be whatever because our understanding of engineering systems and our understanding of the parts that are involved and the processes involved, we had a lot of engineering principles, physical principles that we use to design around failure. Those are all gone. Those are entirely gone. Cyber attacks on physical systems are no longer about engineering principles. They are about the idea that someone is planning an attack, they are looking for a vulnerability, and they are using that attack to harm you. And so that assumption that one turbine will go down is very small, and the second is tiny, is completely out the window. All eight are going down. And so the, the question that this research brings up uh, is, do we need to go back and re-engineer our physical systems because of this new cyber threat to our engineering principles? And our belief is yes. We need to go back and revisit. We need to go back and revisit what principles we've used to design them, what we've placed sensors on, because the sensors have been designed around these engineering principles. And unless we sense certain things, we're not gonna go out of band. We're not gonna have problems with our physical systems. So this first piece of work is around a system theoretical approach. The, the engineering principles are no longer uh, in place, and that the control systems are becoming increasingly complex coupled and software dependent. And so we're getting much more complex environments, control structures, and our engineering principles no longer hold. So security is an emergent property of the system, and that we really need to rethink and re-engineer the design of these complex physical systems uh, using some of the principles that we understand from safety but now applying them to security. But this, I think, is a really, of, of anything about this research that comes across, we are seeing this more and more in, in organizations. Just for just for show, show of hands, have your, the organization, about half of you said you're involved in some manufacturing. Have your organizations considered this in redesigning, looking again at the way in which your plants or operations work or the sensors that you have placed? Anyone gone back and said, we have to relook at this because now we're going to be under attack? Have you taken that system view? So we have a few of you, good, it's very, very good. And I, I, there's, a, there's some work related to this. Uh, Idaho National Labs did some work on this, and there are a number of leading organizations that are start, starting to do this type of reevaluation. Uh, we do this here uh, using an approach, a system theoretic approach, and we actually applied it to a uh, physical, uh, to a utilities plant, uh, roughly designed here through this, this, uh, uh, this picture but using our approach to analyzing their organization under the security umbrella, or the cybersecurity umbrella, we were able to make the following suggestions to the right, which were both technical, procedural, and policy, which were entirely missing from the plant's operations. And these had to do with technical things around uh, safety controllers, uh, out-of-band feedback uh, for, for valve position, and mechanical bolt uh, turbine overspeed protection. Significant sounding things, which we, through this type of systems analysis, could see were vulnerable to cyber attacks. But uh, it was not good enough alone, as many of you are familiar in the, in the cyber world, depending on who, who you read, it's you know, 65 to 95% of all cyber attacks are enabled but in some part by the human either in allowing access or perhaps even in the follow-up of doing something wrong that creates even additional access or unintended consequences uh, for, the, for the defending organization. So we need procedures and policies, and we need to think about the, the, the people in the, in the uh, organization. And this organization, in fact, had to stop 
transferring real-time data to off-vendor sites. It had to stop sharing uh, plant-specific data on public forums. These were things that it were doing, not things that would be caught in an engineering principle analysis, but things that are caught uh, in this safety analysis. So it uses, uh, a based on a um, uh, originally uh, developed uh, th uh, system theoretical approach, uh, which was designed around analyzing the Challenger mission. Um, MIT was tasked in the 1980s to go back and look at the Challenger disaster and analyze what went wrong. And in fact, the analysis was very interesting. How many remember the Challenger incident? What went wrong? Anybody have an idea? O-rings. So everyone, everyone comes with O-rings, and that's sort of the public knowledge. Did you know that the organization that was attached to the uh, quality control of the missions was moved some years earlier from a separate division to the more or less the delivery of mission division so that it was under contract to deliver a certain number of missions in a certain period of time just like the rest of that division did you know that that happened you know some you didn't know so and that itself raised the potential for an accident from a very small number to one in 100, and the Challenger was the 88th mission. So as it turns out, there was, yes, there was an O-ring, but the, behind that was a system-based change that caused this to, to occur, that was the underpinning of it. And we've done this type of analysis looking at the system's approaches. We have a number of examples looking at, uh, in, the, in the case of cybersecurity, we've looked at Stuxnet, we've looked at uh, TJ Maxx, and we've looked at this utility plant, and there are a number of other studies that we've done. And this is an approach to looking at a vulner vulnerability as a, uh, you know, in the control mechanism of the organization. And the underpinnings are function uh, a functional, looking at the functional control structure, what are the constra constraints in the organization, and what is the process model. And more specifically, uh, it, it looks at issues around what is the goal of the mission of the system, what are the most critical functions, what hazards must be controlled. So this is not dissimilar to many things that we're learning in uh, analyzing cybersecurity where someone will talk to you about protecting the crown jewels. What just cannot, what is, what cannot go wrong? what cannot be stolen, what is not allowed to go down, what has to operate 100% of the time. So we do this type of analysis as part of the first step, things like who or what is controlling the hazards, what control feedback paths exist, um, various questions along the way to look at the, the model functional control structure, uh, what creates unsafe conditions, and then what kind of um, a controller interactions would cause these unsafe control actions and how could malicious actions propagate in loss. And this is exactly the type of analysis we did on that central utility plant to make those suggestions. And this is our way of viewing an organization and, and sort of uh, ignoring or looking at a different approach than sort of those engineering principles and saying what can go wrong in cyberspace and how should your organization be uh, technologically and policy-wise and procedural-wise changed in order to protect against those hazards. And the, the, the issue around this is these are the types of system diagrams that we look at, and you can see everything from natural gas regulation station all the way up to, in this case, it's for a, a plant on campus, all the way up to government and regulatory agencies. So, so you can see the systems are quite complex, and unfortunately, the combinant Torx are, are law, can be quite large. So we're looking at the next phase of this to use some agent-based modeling to understand uh, these hazardous conditions and to narrow the study in these systems because many of your manufacturing organizations or production organizations can be co complex uh, to sort of narrow the analysis to those areas that are most significant and, and, and to automate that. So that, that's, that's where we are with this, this project. Uh, we, we've made already a difference in physical plants and the kinds of sensors and the kinds of operations that they've, they've installed. We made those suggestions to, to the physical plant we studied and they are making those sorts of changes. They're, they're not expensive. In this case, these turn out to be relatively inexpensive changes to an organization. 
Um, and they are sort of key points that, that an organization wasn't considering before until they considered the cyber domain. And then quickly mention, we have another project. Um, in this case, Matt Maloney is, is heading up doing the implementation. And this is on protecting uh, industrial IoT endpoint devices uh, uh, in, in a way that um, uh, is distributed and allows them to keep, continue to operate. Uh, I won't go into great detail. I have most of the students that come work to me to go on something like Shodan. I don't know if you've ever been on it, but you can go on and you can find all sorts of open, uh, all sorts of address addressable IP addresses. Um, this happens to be one of my students went online and found this uh, oil tank uh, and can go, uh, uh, go to the IP address and can assess uh, what's the volume of waste oil in the tank, what's the height, all the, the information that comes directly from that, that open port. So they're able to do that and in fact, um, they wanted to do more but I, I, I put a nix on that. So uh, very energetic students here. So we're looking at a combination of um, whitelisting both IP addresses and processes. Uh, we're, we're using machine learning to get those whitelists or to gain those whitelists in, in an operational environment. Uh, we're putting that together with a very lightweight agent to do command and control and also to do uh, using a, a lightweight Ethereum blockchain uh, implementation. Uh, and. This is what it looks like. Uh, the significant components that we're developing are the command and control environment and the uh, lightweight Ethereum blockchain uh, agent, both of which are currently run on uh, things like OpenWRT routers and things like that, but ideally would run on uh, things like PLCs and VFDs and those familiar with those types of uh, things. And units that couldn't, uh, uh, devices that could not hold the, sort of the larger node operation or contain the blockchain, we have a lightweight solution for those. Uh, units without operating systems entirely or uh, with, with no memory and, and ability to, to, to take on any software are, are controlled by something in front of them. Thank you.